My name is Clara Zubrick. And I'm Angela Underwood. And we're education staff here at Weeks Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve. Weeks Bay Reserve is one of 29 research reserves across the country whose mission it is to provide research, stewardship, and educational opportunities about the estuarine environment. Down here on the coast, we define an estuary as where the rivers meet the sea. And Weeks Bay has two headwaters that feed fresh water into the bay. Those are the Fish and Magnolia Rivers. They provide an influx of nutrient-rich fresh water that helps support all the aquatic organisms we have here in the bay and promotes a high amount of biodiversity. So estuaries are important because they are the nurseries for the world's oceans and about 75% of all recreational and commercial fish species spend part of their life cycle in an estuary. And so today we are going to use a seine net and you can see the seine net here and we are going to sample for some of those, uh, those fish species. So when you're seining, some important things to note are the lead line that goes along the bottom and keeps the net anchored to the bottom of the bay. And then you have your float line up at the top. You don't want to get too close to your partner as you're seining because that can cause the net to fall and all of your critters to fall out. And you also don't want to go too fast because that can cause the lead line to float up from the bottom and then species and organisms you collect can swim out and escape underneath the net. We're going to jump into the beautiful Weeks Bay and catch some fish. a little juvenile pinfish and you can see the spiny dorsal fin and those nice yellow stripes going down the side. So you can tell that this is a male blue crab because his abdomen is really narrow shaped kind of like a pencil or the Washington Monument. And the cool thing about blue crabs is that they have three different types of legs. They have the large grasping claws, they have these walking legs on the side, and then in the back they have paddles that help them swim. And their scientific name actually means beautiful swimmer. So why don't we let him go and we can watch him walk along the sand and then maybe start swimming as he gets to the bay. You can see that he uh, detached his claw. When they feel threatened, they can uh, let go of a claw to try to get loose from whatever is chasing it or grabbing it. Uh, and then they're able to actually regenerate that claw. Then also caught several uh, juvenile shrimp. Catching a lot of juvenile mullet and then some tiny little blue crabs. <laughs> also got an Atlantic croaker, which is a member of the drum family, and they're called that because of horizontal muscles that run along their swim bladder and restrict and make a croaking or drumming sound. Menhaden, which is one of the fish species that uh, form large schools within the bay, and they're very important uh, wildlife food for larger fish and even dolphin. So most of these are mullet. So mullet are the fish that you see schooling and then you'll see them jump out of the water 
most likely trying to escape predators. So when we're staining, what are some of the things that you think uh, cause different species to be using the bay at that time? Could it be weather? Could it be the time of the year? It's all of those things put together. So what we're catching in the bay during the springtime is going to be different from what we catch in the bay during the winter. And then what about something like salinity, the amount of salt in the water? Do you think that uh, causes different organisms to use the bay? Well, it does. And so Clara is going to take a few different environmental parameters for us to see what's going on in the bay. We'll take things like uh, air temperature and the water temperature. We'll take salinity and we'll also look to see what the tide is doing because when we have an incoming tide, the salinity might uh, be higher as opposed to when we have an outgoing tide and you have more fresh water coming down the rivers. So right now I'm recording the air temperature. It's important to record air temperature before you take water temperature if you're going to be using the same thermometer. Um, the sensor is located down here and you can see our reading is in Celsius. So it's important to get your air temperature before your water temperature um, because once the sensor gets wet you could get a false reading for air temperature due to um, evaporative cooling, much like um, what happens when you sweat and you have um, the air wicking sweat off. It's that same type of process, so you would end up with a false air temperature reading. So right now our air temperature reading looks like it is about 29 degrees Celsius. So when you go to take your water temperature, it's important to make sure your sensor is fully submerged. And this takes a little bit longer because you want to give your thermometer a chance to calibrate to the true temperature of the water. So usually what we do is we leave it in for 30 seconds to a minute and then we will take it out and read it once and then we will submerge it again for another 30 seconds to a minute and if that temperature stays the same from the first reading then we know we have a true reading. However, if there's any fluctuation you need to submerge it a third time and make sure there's no change between two consecutive readings. Yep. So let's see what our thermometer is reading. It looks like it's at about 23 degrees Celsius, so quite cooler than our air temperature. So let's submerge it again for our second time and see if that is indeed the actual reading. So after the second submergence, it's still reading at about that 23 degrees Celsius mark, so we know that that's the true temperature of the water. So this is our refractometer. We use it to measure the salinity of the water. Um, refraction is the bending of light as it moves through a substance. The refractometer measures how much light is bending, which gives us a measurement of salinity. So our refractometer is reading about two parts per thousand. Um, that's a fairly low salinity range when you consider that the ocean's average salinity is about 33 parts per thousand. Mobile Bay has an average salinity of around 16 parts per thousand. And Weeks Bay, we can see ranges between two, like this low reading today, all the way up to maybe a seven or an eight, depending on tides. And also, um, as Angela mentioned earlier, the amount of freshwater input coming from our rivers. Rain has a lot to do with the amount of fresh water we see coming into the bay and we suspect that this low salinity reading has to do with current rainfall amounts in the state. So another thing we look at when we're determining what species we're catching uh, is the tide and we want to know if it's a high tide or low tide or if it's rising or falling and you can see that today is April 7th and we have what we actually call a neap tide which means there's very little uh, increase or decrease within our high and low tides. And so with that, we don't have a lot of uh, saltwater influence. And even fishermen will say that fishing's bad during a, during a neap tide because there's 
very little water movement, there's no salinity. And so that's, that's another reason we're probably seeing lower salinities today. Another environmental quality we measure is the pH of the water. That has to do with the acidity or alkalinity. pH is measured on a scale of zero to 14 with measurements between zero and seven being acidic and seven to 14 basic. Seven is typically what we think of as neutral. The water we drink is pH of seven, that's neutral. To measure pH, we use this pH paper that comes with these colored squares you can see at the tip. What happens is you dip the squares into the water for a few seconds and you pull them back out. There's a chemical reaction that takes place on the paper and changes the color of these squares to reflect what the pH of the water is. So let's go see what our pH is reading today. One, two. So we see our pH is reading about six, slightly on the more acidic side, which is common in freshwater influenced ecosystems. Um, a lot of the times, especially in our area, that's due to increased tannic acid input from uh, things such like pine trees that grow grow close to our um, rivers that feed the bay and um, those pine needles and leaf litter uh, secrete that tannic acid which is a chemical compound and washes into the water. So the last thing we want to look at is, all, is our wind speed and so this, this instrument is called a kestrel and the kestrel has a little fan that moves as the wind is blowing through it and you can see on the screen that it's measuring the wind movement in miles per hour and it's going up and down as the wind goes up and down and so we want to let it take data for a few seconds and then we can move it over to the average wind speed. And so it looks like the average wind speed right now is only about one mile per hour. Uh, it's just a light breeze. And how does that affect our estuaries? Well, a wind movement causes water to move also. And when you have good water movement, <clears throat> you have better dissolved oxygen within the water. Remember, all living species need oxygen to live. And so within the water, this wind, wind movement helps oxygenate our water. So we're not getting a lot of wind movement today. Uh, wind movement also helps determine our salinity sometimes. If we have heavy winds, that can blow a lot of water out of the bay and so we don't have as much uh, saltwater influence within the bay. But today, not, not much going on with the tides, not much really going on with our wind movement either. Hope you enjoyed standing in the bay with us. We'll catch you next time.